Okay, uh, welcome to the next lecture on entanglement theory. This is a lecture series in support of She Quantum, which is an organization dedicated to supporting women doing research and learning in quantum information science. So now we're gonna, we've built up a lot of the basics on quantum states, quantum channels. What is an entangled state? What is a separable state? What are measures of distance? between states. So now we'll get into what's called entanglement theory. And that's actually the main point of the lectures. Okay, and this is another artistic depiction of entanglement. So just a quick reminder, what is a separable state? It's a state of this form. It's a convex combination of product states that can be prepared by local operations and classical communication alone. Um, a state is entangled if it cannot be written as a separable state. When we focus on pure states, the situation is easier. A pure state is entangled if and only if the Schmidt rank is greater than or equal to two. So it's easy to decide, easy to decide if a pure state is entangled. So what is the motivation of the definition of entanglement? Um, it comes from Bell experiments, okay? So a Bell experiment is a way to demonstrate that um, entanglement cannot be explained by a classical theory. So it consists of spatially separated parties. We can call them Alice and Bob, and they perform local measurements on a quantum state. So how does it go? Alice flips a coin and gets an outcome X. Then based on the value X, she performs a measurement that has the outcome, we'll call it A. Similarly, Bob flips a coin, gets the outcome Y. Based on the outcome Y, he chooses a measurement to perform on his system and it'll have the outcome B. Okay, and so a critical formula for the Bell experiment is this right here. The conditional probability of getting A and B given that X and Y were selected is given by this formula. So this is again, an instance of the Born rule of quantum mechanics. You have the state row AB and these are the measurement operators corresponding to AX, B and Y. Separable states have what's called a local hidden variable theory that describes what's going on. In short, there's a classical explanation for what's going on in a Bell experiment when you use a separable state, okay? So to see this, let's suppose that row AB is separable. So that means you can write it as a convex combination of product states. And now let's look at the conditional probability formula from before, that's this one. If we plug in the separable state form, take the sum over lambda outside, as well as the P of lambda, then we get this expression, right? And so what is this expression saying? Well, this is a classical way of explaining this distribution, right? So it means that Lambda is a hidden random variable that's unobservable to Alice and Bob, but what's going on can be explained in terms of this classical variable, right? So lambda is selected, X is fed in, and then A is output with this probability given the choice of X and lambda. Similarly, B is output given the choice of Y and lambda. So, you know, this can explain what's going on in a Bell experiment when a separable state is employed. This is also called a shared randomness strategy because the lambda can be considered shared randomness that's given to both Alice and Bob. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I don't show it here, but uh, with, with the Bell experiment, there's a way to to test whether you have um, a separable state or, or, 
or a quantum state that can do better than a classical strategy. Okay, so what you do is based on all the data collected, A, B, X, and Y, you compute a, um, I think sometimes it's called like truth function, where like if a certain condition between A, B, X, and Y is met, then you say Alice and Bob win the game. Okay. And, um, oops, I forgot to start the timer for this lecture. I'll just uh, try to end in 10 minutes, I guess. Sorry, let me do that real quick. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we were talking about the Bell experiment and, and the, the, the truth function. So you can say that they win the game if a certain condition is met. And what you can show is that the probability that they win the game with using a classical strategy is no larger than 75%. Whereas by using the maximally entangled Bell state or EPR state, you can win with probability 85%. So it's significantly higher. And then all kinds of things in quantum information are based on that, like quantum cryptographic protocols, ways of controlling distributed quantum computing are based on that, et cetera. It was only recently that what's called the loophole free bell test was conducted at uh, Delft University in the Netherlands. Um, so what does that mean? With the bell experiment, there were two major loopholes. One is that Alice and Bob need to be sufficiently far apart. In this picture, you see that they're on opposite ends of the campus. The other loophole was called the detector loophole. The photon detectors need to be efficient enough such that when a photon impinges on the surface of the detector, it has a high probability of actually clicking. So the technology got good enough, people got clever enough to figure out how to cover these two loopholes. And I believe it was in 2015 when this loophole free bell test was conducted. Okay. One thing you might want to do is given a mathematical description of a bipartite state, you might want to decide if the state is separable or entangled. It turns out in a computational sense, it's hard to do so. So that's been proven. So to make the statement precisely, let's suppose there's a decision problem where you're given a density matrix as a matrix of rational numbers, and there's some error parameter, epsilon strictly greater than zero. So your task is to decide whether the state is a separable state or if it's epsilon far from all separable states, okay? So that has been shown that it's NP hard to solve, even if epsilon is uh, inverse polynomial in the dimension, in the local dimensions of the state. So what does that mean? Um, well, in general, it, it's, it's gonna be hard to decide whether a state is separable and tangled, right? Um, so it's kind of a bummer, but I guess that's just the reality. <clears throat> and the implication is that uh, it's, this problem is going to be hard, hard to solve for both classical and quantum computers. In spite of that, we can try to do one-sided tests for entanglement. And one of the most famous one, one of the most famous tests is called positive partial transpose. So what is the meaning of this? This right here is the way is, is a way to write the matrix transpose as a as a linear map, right? So you input x and you do you sandwich it by i and j and i and j on both sides, and that will compute the transpose of this matrix x with respect to the basis delineated by i. Okay, and the transpose is a positive map. What does that mean? If X is positive semi-definite, then it's transposed as positive semi-definite also. However, um, the transpose is not completely positive. Um, and we're gonna, I think we're gonna return to that in a few slides. 
um, the transpose is called a partial transpose if it acts on one share of a bipartite operator. So it's similar to how we wrote things for partial trace, but now we're talking about partial transpose. So if we do a partial transpose on Bob systems, Bob system, it's just this map right here. So that nothing's happening on Alice's system. It's just the identity and then tensored with these operators for Bob's system. Okay. And a quantum, a bipartite state that has a positive partial transpose, we call it a PPT state for short. So this is a pretty important concept in, in entanglement theory. What is the PPT criterion? Well, let's, let's observe this. Every separable state has a positive partial transpose. Why? Um, let's, let's just act with the transpose, right? So here's the transpose on the outside. Sigma is a separable state, so it can be written like this. Transpose is a linear map. It can come inside the sum and it, it'll act just, it's a partial transpose, so it acts on Bob's system. We said that the transpose is a positive map, right? So if omega is positive semi-definite, omega lambda, then the transpose acting on omega lambda will be positive semi-definite as well. If you tensor a positive semi-definite matrix with another positive semi-definite matrix, and you take a, uh, a weighted sum of these where each weight is a non-negative number, then the overall matrix will be positive semi-definite. So what this is saying is that when the partial transpose acts on a separable state, uh, you get a you, you get a positive semi-definite operator. So that's the claim we can make. Uh, the set of separable states is contained in the set of PPT states. Um, the containment is strict because there do exist PPT entangled states, right? So what we proved here is that if a state is separable then it has a positive partial transpose. What is the contrapositive of that? The contrapositive is if a state does not have a positive partial transpose, then it is not separable. Or equivalently, if a state does not have a positive partial transpose, then it is entangled, okay? But that doesn't tell you anything about the converse of the original statement. So. As it turns out, there do exist kind of these exotic PPT entangled states. Okay. And as an example, you can try out, this is something you can plug into MATLAB. Remember in, the, in a previous lecture, I was talking about KETLAB, Q-E-T lab, that works with MATLAB. You can apply the partial transpose to the maximum entangled state. And then what you'll get is an, a, a matrix that's proportional to the unitary swap operator. And the swap operator has negative eigenvalues, okay? So that, that tells you that the original state is entangled um, because that's the contrapositive. If it does not have a positive partial transpose, then it's entangled. Okay, so as it turns out, it's a lot easier from the perspective of computational complexity, how long it will take your computer to decide uh, whether a state is PPT or not PPT, that's a lot easier to do. So as an example, suppose we have this optimization problem for a Hermitian operator, we're trying to maximize this quantity. I guess it's like the expected value of this operator with respect to all separable states versus the expected value with respect to PPT states. The left-hand side is gonna be hard because you're optimizing over the set of separable states. And we remarked how like, you know, that's, that's that kind of thing is NP hard. However, the right-hand side is what's called the semi-definite program. So that, that you can solve efficiently in the dimension of the local systems. So this is the semi-definite program. That's something you can plug into MATLAB. There's a toolbox called CVX and you could program MATLAB and it could solve this efficiently. Okay, why don't we stop for there? That was a bit about 
entanglement theory. And then we're going to get into what's called the resource theory of entanglement for the next lecture.